I'm, I'm Rachel Hughes and I'm a trustee of the SRA and I'm also the branch chair for SRA Cymru. Now, I don't know whether anybody's got any um, knowledge about the SRA, but we're a membership organisation for social researchers. Um, and as a charity, we aim to advance and conduct the and development of an application of social research for the benefit of public interest and also to advance knowledge and professional practice in the field as well. So we Range, we host and facilitate a range of opportunities and um, for people to do that. And this is one of them, a kind of webinar. Um, just quickly to let you know, though, before I introduce our speaker today, <laughs> um, we have a, an annual conference on the 15th of June, and it will be the first in-person event that we've had um, as an annual conference for a number of years. So this is a really exciting opportunity for us. We've got some terrific speakers lined up and we'll have a host of pres um, presentations from people in, um, who have undertaken social research sharing their learning and their knowledge with us. I'll pop a link to the, the conference in the chat um, in a moment but um, if you're able to join us for that that would be amazing. So on to introduce today's speaker I'm so really really very pleased to welcome Dr Tegan Braley Solis and she is a lecturer in policing criminology and trauma-informed approaches at Wrexham Glyndor University. She's a colleague of mine and she's wonderful. It's amazing, amazing work. So I'm so thrilled that she's able to join us for today. Um, and she will be talking us, to us about um, or sharing with us uh, sort of the emerging trauma-informed practice and culture within the North Wales Youth Justice Service. I think I'll just hand over to Tegan now. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much for um, to present to you all. I'm really, really excited to tell you about my research um, regarding the emerging trauma-informed culture within um, North Wales Youth Justice Service. I do apologise. I, I seem to be losing my voice today, which is always the way uh, when, you, when you come to do these things, but I'm hoping that it holds out. And I've got a nice big bowl of water next to me. Um, so that I can use that as well as we go. So before I um, talk to you and get into some um, some of the detail about some of the findings of my um, research, I just wanted to share with you a story. So it's a Ramdas quote, actually. And Ramdas says that when you go into the woods, you see all different trees. Some are bent, some are gnarled, some are evergreens, all different kinds. And you look at the tree and you allow it. And you understand why it might be a certain way. So maybe it didn't get enough water or enough light, but you still appreciate it for its beauty. And Ramdas practices turning people into trees. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll see the importance of me telling just that story. Um, but there's also another story that I um, because I would also like to thank all of my research participants, both children and service providers, whose stories, spirits and strengths have shaped this research. Um, the service providers, I want to thank for their ongoing interest, their willingness to assist in any way, and the kindness and compassion which they demonstrated whilst I was in their company. I'm also eternally grateful to the children who spoke to me about their experiences, shared their stories and allowed me a glimpse into their lives. And a huge thank you to the people and organisations who have opened so many doors to many wonderful opportunities for me. So this is also for you as well. So I wanted to um, start by telling you um, a little bit about my research voyage. Now you'll um, understand that this uh, webinar today is quite nautical themed. Now, if you've watched the animation Navigating the Storm, um, you'll understand why it's nautical themed, but if not, then I will provide a link to the English and Welsh version for, of the um, animation, and I'll tell you a little bit about the animation in just a second. But I wanted to talk to you about my journey, uh, my PhD journey, before I um, get into telling you about um, some of the experiences that, that um, were shared with me and some of the findings. So I started my journey in 2018. And I um, entered a visualising research um, photo competition. So you'll see on the screen um, a photo which is not going to win any awards by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I titled it The Serene Storm of Inn. And I wanted to, um, basically the idea of behind the visualising research competition was to explain your research in, through a photograph. And um, this was before 
the idea of navigating the storm came along and I had this idea about how um you know water can look so serene and calm on top but actually below we don't know what's going on at all and it can be the same for human beings so I wanted to capture that through an image but I also wanted to explore the idea of a ripple effect and how um a ripple on the water can symbolize um someone gently touching the water but it can also represent um, a storm beginning so I had all of these different ideas that I wanted to put together in, in one photo now, on my PhD journey, there were lots of um, amazing experiences that I had, and I, I had such a wonderful time, but I wanted to just touch on some of the, I would say, highlights for me, um, and the the points that really helped um, pave the way, really. So in 2019, a year into my PhD, I had my first um, experience of presenting at a conference now when I signed up to the PhD the idea was that I presented at a couple of conferences um, a year and I really did not know what to do because I hated um, public speaking I had a real fear of it and I also had 10 minutes to talk about an area that was really complex um, trauma and trauma informed practice so I started to think about how I could do this <coughs> sorry um, so I started to think about how I could do this and what I was thinking was um you know everyone seems to present so so um, eloquently and talk about their work so well and confidently and I remember thinking I wish I could be like that um so then I remember hearing at, at conferences people saying well actually they were so nervous the whole time and it really got me thinking how we experience everything so differently to how uh, we might come across and, and we all experience life so differently. So again, I use the analogy of water at the conference to talk about um, how when we look out at the ocean, we, we will all feel different feelings towards it. Some of us will be excited and want to explore and see it full of potential. Some of us will be fearful and frightened. So I started to build upon the metaphors at the conference and that was really the start of navigating the storm. Um, the journey of navigating the storm and the, and the animation behind using metaphors and analogies to explain trauma and trauma formed approaches. And then a year later, I um, presented it more fully at the Open House for Research, which really has been quite life changing. And um, I'll, I'll forever be uh, so, so grateful for everyone that attended. And um, I also wanted to talk about how I had to steer my research in a new direction because when I first started initially I was looking at trauma informed interventions. Uh, what I came to realise is that was there wasn't anything um, any specific interventions that were um, termed trauma informed but actually it was the culture of the organisation instead so I changed my research to look at the trauma informed culture um, of youth justice and I also had to steer it in a new direction because of the pandemic because I started my data collection in 2020 and I got a few interviews and focus groups carried out before we went into lockdown but then um, I had to really when we went into lockdown I had to really think about the way forward for the research and be quite reflective and adaptive and I decided to work through a trauma-informed lens on my approach and Actually, I didn't feel that it would be trauma informed to interview um, children virtually about this topic because it's such a sensitive topic area. And although I didn't ask children directly about their trauma, um, I still felt that it wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, so I didn't um, interview as many children as I first envisaged doing, um, but I did. I was able to to carry on. Um, interviewing and carrying out focus groups virtually with service providers. So there was a, a, a slight shift in my direction. The other thing that I just wanted to um, touch upon in my voyage is how I adapted trauma informed principles for my data collection. So I ensured that I adhered to the 10 trauma informed principles coined by Elliot and colleagues in 2005 during my data collection. And the principles were adapted for use in research with victims of sexual violence by Campbell and colleagues in 2019, which I also followed and adapted as appropriate for my piece of research. So I led with the awareness that anyone can be trauma survivors of some description. And so I applied um, the principles to both interviews and focus groups with children and service providers. 
and this included, for example, understanding the coping mechanisms identified by participants and the continuing impact which trauma has had on their lives, including involvement with the criminal justice system. Another principle um, is to emphasise individual strengths and resiliency, which I attempted to do via the use of active listening techniques. I'm very sorry, <laughs> my voice is really going. Yeah, with the um, with active te uh, listening techniques to understand choices made, whilst also highlighting um, strengths that I was able to pick up in the conversations that I had. I also tried to ensure that the environment in which the data collection took place felt safe because being safe and feeling safe are very different things. We could all be safe, um, for example, in this moment in time, but not all of us will feel safe. <clears throat> So I really wanted to ensure that that fell safety was a given throughout the um, throughout the interview process. So I wanted to um, just talk to you about three um, main themes before I talk to you about my uh, some of my findings from the research. So the first I wanted to talk about was trauma in general. So the term trauma um, holds Greek origins, meaning wound, and a metaphoric spin was placed upon it by Freud to explain how um, the mind can be wounded too. However, a universal definition does not readily present itself. <laughs> and this is because um, trauma may be thought of in medical terms and as a biopsychosocial response as well. So trauma is subjective and, so, and various definitions exist in an attempt to understand a complex and broad area. And generally, um, trauma is considered an event or um, a um, set of um, circumstances which are harmful in some way and leaves an imprint within an individual. So I put on the screen the SAMHSA definition, which is an event series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Now, there are many different types of trauma, um, including personal, which can be singular, non-singular, or prolonged, and is subjective based on the individual's internal world. There's also cultural trauma, which is the fragmentation of particular groups' um, system of meaning, and this can occur when an overpowering event weakens various elements, for example, values, um, beliefs and ideologies of a particular culture. And also relational trauma, um, which is known as attachment trauma, and it's interlaced with developmental trauma due to trauma potentially disrupting the forming of a secure and trusting attachment relationships. Um, now, there are many other types of trauma that exist outside of these three as well. That if individuals experience insecure attachment in childhood, they may find relationships challenging in the future and also lack emotional understanding, which is manoeuvred by behavioural and emotional responses to attachment based experiences. Um, now, it's similarly and unimportantly, I wanted to talk about um, trauma informed practice. So similarly to trauma, it does lack conceptualisation and it doesn't have a universal definition. And so practitioners and organisations construct their own. And this has led to a variety of definitions which exist and seek to interpret trauma from practice. This person-centred whole system approach and differs from trauma-focused interventions, which seek to address underlying trauma. Instead, it adopts a universal approach which promotes safety, trustworthiness, support, collaboration, choice and empowerment. And what it does is it flips the switch from what is wrong with you to what happened to you, what matters to you and who is there for you. Trauma informed is about embedding a culture of understanding, curiosity and reflection instead of reaction. It's relational, it's attachment and connection focused because after all we're human beings and we crave social connections and we know the importance of this. The Harvard study on adult development one of the longest running studies on, on happiness starting in 1938 shows that emotional and mental stimulation is created through person connections which boost our moods and make us happier. 
Um, now in Wales, we have um, a trauma informed um, framework now, which is excellent. And there are five practice principles um, to be trauma informed, which is universal approach that does no harm, person centered, relationship focused, resilience and strengths focused and inclusive. And this trauma informed uh, Wales framework was created by the ACE Hub Wales and Traumatic Stress Wales with the help of, a of an expert reference group and it's available um, online to read through and it, it's a um, really in-depth um, framework and also if we um, use the animation and uh, analogies around nautical themes to describe describe um, trauma and trauma-informed approaches being trauma informed is like being a lighthouse because a lighthouse is a beacon of hope and represents safety to guide our boats through difficult situations. It lights the way ahead, empowering us to continue our journey, however that might look, whilst remaining a constant source of reassurance that we can move forward, forward where there's opportunity given to us and where guidance is received if needed. In this way, organisations can be represented as lighthouses their effectiveness measured by the lens that they apply. Organisations who understand and are responsive to trauma have worked to apply a lens which enables them to undertake various transformations needed at multiple levels, whilst constantly reflecting on their mission, values and work to ensure a nurturing, sensitive service is felt for all. And in this way, their lighthouse lens can be likened to a Fresnel lens, which comprises of tiers of prisms, which refract and then reflect the light as it passes through creating a brighter beam. The tiers of prisms uh, represent the importance of multi-level change throughout the whole system, while the reflection of light symbolises the need for organisations to continually reflect, learn and grow. And the final um, element that I wanted to touch upon before I tell you about my own research was around the therapeutic relationship. Now, I believe that you can create a home for people in the relationship that you share with them. You can fill a space with love, character, soul and creativity, and you'll be met there with gratitude, even if it takes a while. So the word therapeutic comes from Greek therapeutic, meaning to attend to another. And in this sense, a therapeutic relationship is one like no other. One individual offers presence, care, compassion and any act to manifest healing, but expects nothing in return. And this is unlike our personal relationships, which require mutual balance of give and take. No matter who the individual is, the purpose of the therapeutic relationship remains the same, to connect with another uh, as a person in order to facilitate their healing. Therapeutic relationships exist in many settings and are often associated with counselling and therapy, but also in healthcare. However, I found in my research that service providers viewed the relationship that they shared with justice-involved children as therapeutic. Now, there are many um, theories of therapeutic relationships. Carl Rogers put forward one, which includes three active components. Um, so congruence, which is a condition in um, a therapeutic relationship that refers to accurate matching of a person's experience with awareness. And it means understanding feelings and thoughts accurately. Empathy, um, which we know is, is defined as an individual's capacity to um, place themselves in another person's position. And finally, unconditional positive regard. So when you have unconditional positive regard for someone, nothing they could do could give you a reason to stop seeing them as inherently human and inherently lovable. It doesn't mean that you accept each and every action taken by the person, but that you accept who they are at a level much deeper than surface behaviour. So within a therapeutic relationship, it's usual for a trauma narrative to be shared, and I'll be coming back to this point in, in um, a little while. So the title of the webinar is um, Surfing the Waves of Compassionate Accountability. Well, what is compassionate accountability? Well, trauma-informed practice is knitting into the fabric of many organisations and spheres, including the criminal justice system. Research suggests correlation between trauma and those who interface with the criminal justice system. However, confinement within the criminal justice system is designed for those who offend rather than those who have experienced adversity. Many practices and procedures with, which exist within the criminal justice system, such as um, disciplinary approaches, strip searches and restriction on movement may be tra traumatising or re-traumatising for individuals and in turn 
may lead to an increase in behaviour reflective of trauma, such as aggression, which can be challenging for staff. Trauma-informed practice may be seen as beneficial. However, the challenge lies in, in managing perceptions of um, viewing offending via a trauma-informed lens as overly sympathetic whilst disregarding the victim. Instead, the context of offending should be considered alongside trauma histories. Um, Miller and Najafit um, suggest that despite challenges and careful consideration which must be made, trauma-informed practice can enhance the criminal justice um, environment in terms of safety. It can result in better outcomes for individuals who interface with the criminal justice system and develop pro-social coping skills. Trauma-informed culture within the criminal justice system does not mean that individuals will not be held accountable because they will, but this happens in a compassionate way. So working through a trauma-informed lens means employing gentle curiosity around an individual, their behaviour and responses, and developing a culture and indeed interventions which support the development of emotion regulation skills, empathy and personal ownership of change whilst contextualising their behaviour. So now I'm going to move on to tell you about some of the findings in um, my research, starting with behaviour as communication. So what you can see on screen are some um, quotes taken from participants. Um, the first two quotes are from children. So first child said, I was bullied all through primary. I had an abusive dad, an abusive stepdad. And when I was in my dad's, if I didn't drink with him at stupid age, I would get beaten up. This child stated that these experiences were one of the reasons that they started offending because they really struggled to manage their um, their anger and they struggled to manage their emotions. And likewise, likewise, um, the second quote, um, uh, the child stated that their pathway onto the offending trajectory began when their mom went to prison, which triggered a lot of emotion for them. So um, emotional dysregulation resulting from psychological distress was considered by service um, providers in relation to police call out. So it was recognised by service providers that um, what, what was termed as aggressive youth were actually children who were scared, anxious, fearful, traumatised um, and going through a really difficult time. So that, that was recognised by service providers. When we're distressed as babies, we can't self-regulate. So we rely on attunement from a regulated and predictable adult to soothe us and get us back into a calm, regulated and balanced state. As we know, adolescence is a period of growth, development and where self-soothing mechanisms develop in either a healthy or potentially unhealthy way, depending on our experiences. And these things may provide comfort and relief in the short term, but they can be damaging long term. We self-soothe to help us reach equilibrium after a difficult time, but also to get our needs met. We may not be able to process how to respond to environmental stressors, and so we use avoidant or unhealthy coping strategies which may influence our behaviour or indeed stem from emotion which we're unable to regulate. As a result of our emotional needs being unmet, we might feel shame, uh, we might feel unworthy and we might feel unlovable. And so we seek to feel the abandonment externally. The construction of behaviour as a form of communication via coping mechanisms has implications for wider understanding and responses to criminal behaviour. So, for example, if a criminological lens was applied to the processes of behavioural communication, um, whether there's a perceived coping mechanism or not, we can understand where trauma has been experienced. Now, behaviour is already understood as a form of communication, but my thesis adds to this argument in that criminal behaviour can be viewed as a form of communication signalled as a distress flare of an unmet need. And it's not always obvious either. So we, we communicate when we're in survival response, which manifests in various ways, but others around us and we ourselves may not realise we're even doing it. For example, disassociation is an adaptive survival response that allows us to function in survival mode. It means that we often appear zoned out or perhaps relaxed, but internally we're experiencing a severe disconnection from ourselves and others. And sometimes it's because we've experienced dysregulated adult relationships, which make us feel like we're not lovable or we personalise events in order to try and keep a bond. 
and this makes us feel like we are unsafe and there's no one there to help us um, make sense of what might be happening. Sometimes the trauma we experience, which is stored in our body, starts to reveal itself through our relational connections with other people. For example, if the love we experience is conditional and taken away based on our behaviour or, or words or doing something that somebody disagrees with, then we may turn to people pleasing as a safety mechanism to protect ourselves. It's our full response kicking into action where we appease others to in order to avoid danger. Another theme of finding within my research when creating trauma-informed culture within youth justice was the importance of viewing the child holistically and forming meaningful, uh, meaningful connections and relationships with them rather than criminalising them. So some of the children involved in the research considered the relationship with staff as the most important thing. However, it was um, appreciated that building safe relationships did come with challenges because justice involved children may have experienced relational trauma and so trust in relationships with adults may feel uncomfortable for them and quite difficult to begin with. So in my study, um, it was acknowledged by service providers that trauma experienced by justice involved children could be interpersonal and lead to problems regulating emotions and behavioural changes and also relational difficulties which might impede on the child practitioner relationship and some of the child participants also um, discussed impaired maternal caregiving which is associated with the relational model of trauma and um, this was could be from the child's point of view direct for example, where neglect was experienced or indirect, where the mother was imprisoned and therefore not able to care for the child. And where trauma is um, interpersonal, it becomes relational. So Dr. Karen Treesman, who's a clinical psychologist specialising in trauma, suggests that healing focused on relational repair must take place when relational trauma has been experienced. Relational practice holds the relationship at the centre of all work by facilitating reliable and supportive connections whilst also empowering individuals to participate in decision-making processes. And this practice gives the opportunity for the building of trust and respect, which engenders feelings of belonging, connections, and feeling cared for and valued. And so it acts as a scaffold for future relationship building. Um, Child First philosophy is advocated within youth justice, and it has four components, which is to view children as children, uh, to develop a child's pro-social identity in order to elicit positive outcomes, to collaborate with children and to promote diversion. This really um, speaks to trauma-informed philosophy, which advocates a human-centred approach, whereby each aspect of an individual is to focus rather than simply their behaviour and their experiences. The study findings demonstrated the way children perceived youth justice practitioners taking an interest in their lives and focusing on their strengths rather than simply their behaviour. And service provider participants discussed the idea of being child-centred and child-friendly, which suggests the emphasis on ensuring that youth justice is child-first and view children as children rather than labelling them as offenders. At the same time, when working through a trauma-informed lens, care must be taken to not stigmatise and label based on um, trauma experiences too because whether that's as a passive victim or um, based on research which discusses correlation between trauma and a negative life trajectory. Correlation and causation are two different things and we're not defined by what's happened to us. These experiences are simply a tesserae of our life's mosaic. Um, so finally, I wanted to talk about another finding, and it's recognised that trauma histories are prevalent in both children accessing youth justice and those in custody. And this was um, reflected in the current study. So uh, I mentioned earlier, I didn't ask um, children directly about their personal experiences of trauma. But interestingly, each child opened up and told me their story. Um, I mentioned therapeutic relationships earlier and how this study concluded that the child practitioner relationship may be viewed via a, a therapeutic lens. So when working in a relational and therapeutic way, space is created which allows for the sharing of trauma narratives, which can encourage healing for the children. Life experiences, both positive and negative, move beyond the senses and become organised into stories which help individuals to narrate and reflect on who they are, but also on the complexities of their life events. Both children and service providers involved in 
in um, my study alluded to the crisis management aspect of youth justice and uh, talking through challenges and previous trauma may lead to emotional catharsis. So one of the children in the study discussed how attending um, youth justice supports their well-being because they felt that they could discuss issues and express their feelings. But perhaps most applicable to that child practitioner relationship is the process of being an empathic witness of injustice. So for youth justice practitioners, this require, requires providing a space for the child to tell their story, but also respond in a way which is sympathetic to the moral trauma that's taken place to them. So allowing space for the child to share their trauma narrative and respond to it with understanding and compassion is akin, uh, akin to mooring a boat at the harbour. So allowing time to rest, repair, and reach a state of equilibrium before setting off on sail again. Therapeutic relationships which involve the retelling of trauma narratives have been considered beneficial with regards to enhancing reflexivity and the self-evaluative um, processes. And um, this might be particularly useful within youth justice as it encourages children to um, reflect and understand behaviour in relation to their trauma histories and reframe adversity. So an example from my study stems from the children's accounts who recognise via their interaction with youth justice, their behaviour and subsequent coping mechanisms such as substance dependence may be connected to their previous adverse experiences. Children um, also alluded to behavioural change resulting from both conversations shared with youth justice practitioners centred around consequential thinking and collaborative problem solving and also simply the act of youth justice practitioners being present and listening to them when challenges um, arose and also being there in moments of contingency. However, when working in a relational therapeutic way, trauma absorption is a risk to practitioners so clinical supervision may be available to staff via the enhanced case management model, which has been rolled out across Wales. However, practitioners also recognised the support within the office amongst staff, which was beneficial. But this informal support could not always happen because of the intensive workloads experienced. So in order to understand vicarious trauma, um, it's helpful to consider how we process our experiences. So if we think of the frontal cortex, um, is like a uh, vacuum, picks up everything in its path. Some stuff we might not even realise because we're so young or may not consciously be aware of it in the moment, but it involves all of our senses and we're consciously aware about five to ten percent. The other 90 percent is subconscious, but that doesn't mean that we aren't processing what we take in. It all gets processed in the hippocampus, which it's like our brain's phone manager. Now, I use the phone analogy because we've all hopefully got a smartphone so we can understand it. Um, and what the hippocampus does as our phone manager is it helps us sort and store information. So the experiences are different apps on our phone and the phone manager sorts away and puts those apps into organised groups. When they're stored, it sends the message to our amygdala, which is like the antivirus on the phone. It tells the rest of our body how to respond to that information. Some information gets processed and stored pretty well. Others may end up overwhelming the phone manager and they are unable to be stored. In that case, the app is kept on the phone desktop and the phone manager alerts the antivirus system, AKA alerts the amygdala of threat. So then our amygdala sets off one of our trauma responses. So when we experience trauma in childhood, it can turn into those apps on the phone desktop, unable to be stored, meaning that you experience, if you experience anything that relates to that app, either directly or indirectly, your brain will not be able to differentiate between real adversity and perceived adversity, which means that our alarm will go off whenever adversity is perceived, amplifying our emotion and dysregulating our behaviour. If this happens too often, being unaware of the adverse apps lingering on our phone desktops, we utilise unhelpful stress responses and they might help in the short term by numbing feelings, for example, but often lead to issues longer term. So you can see how our own experiences may also lead to vicarious trauma because we may have to support an individual who has experienced something similar to us, which makes our phone manager panic and send a stress response to our bodies. So vicarious trauma occurs through a transference of 
emotional residue from those who have experienced trauma onto those who engage them in an empathic relationship. Vicarious trauma is directly connected to typically detailed and in some cases graphic disclosures of trauma and negative changes occur via vicarious trauma and include those among others which are cognitive, emotional, physical. It's often associated with therapeutic and clinical roles. However, it is relevant for youth justice practitioners due to the long-term holistic relationship formed with the children in youth justice. It's different to secondary traumatic stress, which is more common with frontline emergency service workers, because there's often not an empathic relationship formed, but they are still exposed to trauma. Um, service providers in the study described roles in youth justice as counsellor orientated um, in order to acknowledge and empathise with the child's lived experience of trauma and to create an emotional bond with them. And so vicarious trauma was alluded to as a potential outcome of a more relational trauma informed way of working with children and therefore requires careful management and support mechanisms, including supervision and informal debriefing between staff to enhance and maintain well-being. In my study, um, both supervision and um, informal debriefing were discussed. However, it was recognised that resource and implications may influence the delivery of clinical supervision and the fast paced environment of youth justice may not always allow for informal debriefs to take place as often as required. So in relation to this, organisations who provide intensive support for individuals with trauma histories may start mirroring trauma symptoms, also known as trauma organised organisations. So trauma organised systems may develop because of external or indeed internal dysfunctions. And so emotional distress becomes embedded into the culture, which results in stress as a segment of its defining feature. Much like individuals, organisations can display trauma responses such as fights where conflict is rife and punitive measures um, might be relied on to, to maintain control. Um, they can also display flight where there's an avoidance of certain role aspects and absenteeism, and they can display freeze, which involves a disconnect between colleagues and systems. So practitioners themselves may also be working through or have experiences of trauma, which they may unconsciously be struggling with. So certainly for in, the, in my study, um, service providers did allude to personal experiences of trauma and adversity. Um, trauma organised systems might, might respond to that stress by implementing further structure, which unfortunately may then result in inflexibility and a culture of blame and negative experiences. Therefore, what happens is um, negative memories are created and they become part of the organisational scaffold, which paves the way to stress inducing rather than um, a stress reducing system. So embedding trauma informed practice within the criminal justice system presents unique challenges due to the organisational culture, embodying justice and the historical focus on punishment. However, the benefits of working through a trauma informed lens should drive shifts to combat such challenges and help organisations work towards becoming the lighthouse. So in conclusion, my study found that some offending behaviour is perceived as a strategy to communicate distress which may be via coping mechanisms um, such as substance use, which may lead to altered behavioural states. It may also relate to occasions where powerful emotions are difficult to articulate, therefore expression occurs through behaviour. Um, also, in order to work through a trauma-informed lens, a cultural shift is required in order to embed values, policies and practice across all levels of the youth justice um, system. A further practical concepts include the need to work through child first and trauma informed lens, which complement each other through um, the shared strengths based foundation. However, care must be given that labelling does not occur from an offending perspective or indeed based on trauma experiences. And the space and relationship shared between children and um, practitioners involves elements of therapeutic processes and techniques often used by counsellors. However, also considered was um, the repercussions of forming healing relationships, including the risk of vicarious trauma, which um, my study found to be an important issue, which does require addressing at a strategic level in order to adequately support staff and the children that they're working with. So in order to end the presentation, which my voice has managed to make it through, <laughs> I'm pleased to say, um, I wanted to finish with one of my favorite quotes, which really does bring um, 
bring the conversation full circle, I, I feel, um, from Luis Cosolino. And um, it resonates with the story I told you at the beginning about the trees. We are not the survival of the fittest. We are the survival of the nurtured. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'll un unshare my screen now. I can come back to you. Thank you very much. What a, an amazing quote that is as well. I can see that's why that's one of your favourites. I think I'm going to share that quote with others as well. So <laughs> thank you so much for a really fascinating discussion. I've got I've got questions myself, but before um, I ask those, because I've got even though I know you and I've worked with you and I, you know, Work, I've done some work in this field. I've still got some burning questions. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Please, please, you know, I think we can raise your hand. I think you can do that, I think, through the through the function. Yes, uh, raising hand is, and also uh, questions can also be uh, okay. uh, submitted as well. Cool, into the, uh, the Q&A. Yes. Yeah, great. If anybody has any questions, please do do share. Just to let people know as well, whilst uh, people are gathering thoughts, I have popped some links into the chat facility. So I put a link in there to our annual conference, which I mentioned at the outset, but also to the English and Welsh version of Navigating the Storm. And I'd highly recommend uh, watching the animation it, and sharing it as well, because with a lot of work that that Tegan's been talking about, although it was it was coming from the criminal, you, you know, the justice system, its applicability is into any sector, any organisation, any environment, working with people, you know, this, um, it's widely applicable. So yeah, please, please do, to, if you have a moment to, to have a look at those animations, they're fab. And I also put the framework in there that Tegan mentioned as well, which has the five practice principles in there, if anybody wants to delve into this in more detail. <laughs> I've also got my email address in a second ago. Thank you. Right, well, I'll, I'll kick off then. I was um, I was really interested in what you were talking about kind of quite at the outset, where you were talking about applying a trauma-informed lens and, and, and that practice into into your research I'm just thinking we've got a bunch of social researchers on on this seminar today and and others who may be involved in social research even if you don't have that label um but what are the things that you practically did in order to be able to to you know to have that have that approach in your research and think about some of the kind of wider applications and learning that we can take with us to kind of any kind of social research that we might be undertaking I guess um so with the Things that I did was um, really engaged oh, in the listening. Uh, Tegan, your um, mic seems uh, oh. slightly weak. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can move, move slightly something. Is maybe that better? Something. Might yes. be my voice that's weak. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> <also> <laughs> probably true. Sorry, keep going. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think practically, I'd say. Um, yeah, engaging in the active listening aspect of it with with everybody, but also, um, so what I found was that especially with the children, they really struggled to acknowledge any strengths that they had, and um, they they spoke um, spoke of themselves in, through quite a negative lens quite often, and um, described themselves in quite a negative way. So when I was employing the trauma informed principles um part part of that is about kind of nurturing strengths and being um coming at it from a strengths-based perspective so what I would do was when in the conversations I was because I was taking part in the active listening aspect of it as well I um as we were talking I was sort of going along with what they said and picking up the strengths and actually repeating it back to to them but from a strengths perspective so I, I remember one particular example and it happened um in different ways throughout um the interviews but one particular example was was one of the children I spoke to was was um incredibly kind of hard on themselves and um really negative about themselves actually and they didn't recognize anything 
good that they did at all. And they, they were telling me a story. And I said, you know, it sounds like you're such a caring sibling. You're such a caring sibling to, to, to your younger siblings. And they just stopped for a moment and they were like, oh, yeah, I am actually. I'm a really, I'm a really caring sibling and I really love them. And it's just those little, um, like, little seeds that you can plant for them whilst you're, you're on a journey, which can, or, you know, like, it might not change the way that they feel about themselves in that moment, but it gives them an idea that actually they they have strengths and they can, you know, those strengths are amazing and they have, you know, they can build on those as well. So they there was, like, some of those practical elements, but something which I was really keen to do and I wasn't able to because, because um, we went into lockdown just before but I had I had had permission and it had all gone through ethics um as well at that point was um I had been interviewing the children and um it was just kind of a conversation but then when the recording stops as we all know as researchers more conversation happens after the recording stops and and I was saying to them what would make this process better for you and um they, they quite often they were saying oh if we could do something whilst we were talking like cooking or or go for a walk or um play football I mean they just clearly don't know anything about my sporting um <laughs> non-sporting background so I wouldn't have the first clue but I was thinking that would be really interesting and a cool way to do this because they wouldn't be focused on uh the recording device between us actually they would be busy doing something and they would that might you know relieve any anxiety if they were feeling that way so I had planned to change the process um, so that we were doing activities instead and the child would pick which activity that we would do and we would have the conversation um, based you know depending on what was available what resources were available within that youth justice service so some of them might have a kitchen so we were going to cook um, in the kitchen together and, and do that um, and again that would have given the child um, choice so moving forward if I do research in this area again or, or involve in this sort of topic area that would be the way that I would again bring in some of those practicalities is thinking about the ways in which that I could carry out the research that um so so that there was you know that children felt that felt more comfortable in the process as well yeah lovely um, and it reminds me of a, a method with somebody who I used to work with a long long time ago actually um who his PhD and this is going back 20 years now but he was talking about um he was talking with or discussing um, people who were wanting to protect the environment. And he used being in their spaces and the environment which they wanted to protect as a way of having those conversations because so much, so much, so much of it, you can't actually say it's about being there and how you feel. So it's sort of in a similar vein. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat as well. The first one from Sue Williams. Thanks, Sue. Um, interest, she says, interesting to see all the analogies to nature. Have you done any work thinking about um, the use of nature to help heal trauma? That's a lovely a question. question. Um, so I haven't, uh, in my PhD, I didn't. Um, but now I've finished. I mean, everyone keeps saying, what are you, what's next? And I'm interested in that aspect of, OK, well, what do we do now? Um, now what you know how can we work to heal trauma and I'm really interested in um looking at, at ways that perhaps haven't yet been explored because as I said with the vicarious trauma work um there's a lot out there around you know the, the need for things like clinical supervision and um the kind of informal debriefs between staff but I think sometimes um you know in this world you have to be brave and think okay well what else can we try um, you know what else might work for other people because we're all so different and some people may feel not very comfortable sitting and talking to somebody about things other people might actually prefer like you say going out and being in nature and talking whilst they're, they're out in nature um, and it not necessarily be ter termed as um, you know counselling or what whatever actually just the process of doing something practical but being able to share a conversation could be amazing. So uh, I was thinking along the lines of things like holistic therapies and um, what that can do for an individual, because although it's not, it won't necessarily be about the treatment that that person receives, I personally think it would probably be more around that relationship that they share with that person because they, they can go there 
and they can say to people I'm just going for a massage for example or whatever but actually when they get into that room it's their chance to to relax and to open that up and to talk about some of these things um so I'm really interested to to look at that next um and that's something that hopefully I'll have the chance to be able to do yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it, when you're talking about relations, and actually it's about relationship with whether it be, um, you know, nature, whether it's with individuals in a service area, whether it's about holistic therapies, all of those things are relational, aren't they? Just the, um, yeah, so it's, um, it's really important. Thank you. We've got a, um, a question here from somebody who says, great talk, thank you. Um, does your work or your findings touch on any forms of collective trauma, for example, racial trauma or even COVID related trauma? Um, it didn't actually. Um, no, it didn't really go into. I suppose I think probably the reason being is that when my um, data collection started, we were just going into um, into the, into the lockdowns then. So, of course, it was sort of mentioned but more as as it as it was as it was sort of mentioned in general back then you know people kind of um talking about mainly work going working on, online and things like that um and i think some there were some conversations about whether um the whole you know the pandemic was a collective trauma or or wasn't it so there was there were conversations in and around that aspect but nothing um directly came out of my research around racial trauma or, or collective trauma although it is interesting because um you know if you think about things like group trauma that's often you know associated with first line responders so so police and staff who work who go out to situations which can be really traumatic and, and they witness this this trauma and they experience this this trauma together and again um you know going forward around the work around healing trauma that's another aspect that I'm really interested in is is not only um, vicarious trauma in terms of the relationship built, but some more of that wider collective trauma that sometimes felt and that group trauma and how, uh, what can be done to, to facilitate healing in those um, areas as well. I just said, yeah, and I realized I was on, I was on mute. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> um. Oh, thank you. And we have another question here. Thank you for all the questions coming through. It's really, it's really good because we just get all different perspectives and lenses on things. So yeah, we really appreciate these questions. Thank you. So this is from Matilda. Um, what are the best strategies to carry out research with potentially traumatized participants whilst also ensuring no harm? You know, what are the best ways of protecting participants? That's a really good question, really important for us as, as researchers. Yeah. Really great question. Um, I would say that personally for, for me what I did was um, I mean uh, this possibly isn't it isn't uh, possible for every piece of research that's carried out but I knew uh, for me I wasn't asking people directly about their trauma and the reason that I uh, one of the reasons that I didn't want to ask directly about um, their trauma is because I didn't want to re-traumatize them either and um, it was interesting that it despite me not doing that I was still told um, stories so having that space you know that that was still alluded to so I guess um I guess it it depends if you um have you know if part of the research is around talking about that trauma but it's really about creating a safe space um in that moment where that person is is supported and if possible supported by somebody who has been facilitating their support prior as well because I was I was quite fortunate in that the children that I um, interviewed had case managers who knew their history and was was able to offer that support should there have been a need for it, um, and that I was able to carry out the um, the interviews nearby so that it, again if there was any, I mean that didn't happen but if there was a need for it then you know that would have helped um, should that have have came up but it was about um, creating a space that that felt safe. Um, and I guess creating a space that feels safe enough for, for participants to be able to um, talk about these things without having, um, without feeling like they're back in that situation. So being able to look back on things and understand it as a memory rather than actually being back and, and living in that thing. And, and I think that can be quite difficult. And I wouldn't know the answer to to being able to 
to do that um with with certain individuals who have been traumatized i guess in my research i was fortunate in that i did have the the support from uh, youth justice staff who have been supporting those those individuals and what i found um interesting in that respect is that when children were talking about their experiences uh, they actually did mention the process of of being re-traumatized through telling their story or well being made to tell their story I would say because they they as I said they were quite um willing to share but they a couple of them did mention how if they were passed from pillar to post so from organization to organization and they had to tell their story they you know they had to, to give the, these accounts actually it was really difficult for them to one tell the story but um you know a couple of them actually said well in the end I just shut off because I didn't want to talk to people anymore about it I'd, I told the story so many times and it wasn't shared amongst people so I had to tell it again and again and and um I didn't like it so I just stopped talking in the end um so there's something really interesting about that as well mm. Great, thank you. It's really useful and helpful shared um, learning and insights there that I'm sure that we could all apply in, in all the work that we do. We've come to the end of our time. So thank you. I just say, you know, to everybody who's joined the call and particularly to Tegan today as well for, you know, a, a wonderful um, and really thought provoking um, seminar. So thank you so much. Thank you again for everybody who's joined us today. And we've got another couple of seminars that are planned. Um, so keep your eyes out for, for those over the coming months. Um, there'll be details on our website. And if you subscribe to receive our, our newsletter and e-bulletins, there'll be details in there as well. And also on our social media. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Diach. Diach. Thank you, everyone. Bye.